All right. Welcome back to the Road Less Traveled podcast. We have our second guest here. Yay! It's Sarah Heron, <laughs> one of my old friends. Yeah. Dating back to 12 years now. Yeah. During our bachelor days. Yeah. I, I have an intro here, and I really think I need to read it because truly you have so many accolades. Oh, my And gosh. you've done so much. Okay. Um, I was trying to prepare this, this episode and this interview, and I was like, you've done so much. Here Thank I go. You. Okay. Bachelor alum from season 17 <laughs> with me. Um, Bachelor in Paradise alum times two. Content creator and storyteller. Advocate for others with able-bodied disabilities. Mental health advocate. Traveler. Adventure enthusiast. IVF warrior woman. Mom to son Oliver. Her angel baby. And is now pregnant with twin girls. She's also no stranger to leading communities of women. From She Lift Escapes to Tents Without Gents to the Infertile Circle community. And truly, the list goes on and on. Um, <laughs> when you look up after 37 years of life, do you yeah. feel like you've lived multiple lifetimes? Um, that's a good question. Um, like, yes and no. I feel like it's all just been a gradual evolution of the same life. Mm -hmm. I mean, in so many ways, like, yes, there's so many chapters, right? But all of it has just been like one chapter bleeds into the next and one chapter turns the next chapter into like the saga that it becomes. And so, yeah, I feel like there's been a lot. And to recap what you just said, even in 12 years is like, oh my gosh, that's so much has gone on, but I can never sit still. So it's yeah. kind of just the nature of me always yeah. kind of on to the next thing. And I feel like I, I'm similar to that. And I feel like we've always had a lot of synergies too. Yeah. Like we are nomads at heart. I think we're an adventure enthusiast. We've done uh, Angel's Landing hike in Utah yeah. together. Yeah. We've seen California together on some different bachelor stuff. Yeah. Um, we, we went to, uh, where did we go in Canada? Banff. Lake Louise. Yeah. yeah, one of your favorites. Montana. Yeah, Montana. Whitefish. It all speaks yeah. to the love of our outdoors, really. <laughs> I know. I feel like that season was designed for us. I do too. And then I got sent home, but that's okay. Same. <laughs> same you girl, same. <laughs> Probably never have to go back to St. Croix. I've known you for 12 years now. Mm -hmm. You were the very first person I met on our season. I know. I'll never forget it. I we know. So if you don't know, you're sequestered in this hotel room when you go on The Bachelor for, I don't know, four or five days. Yeah. Uh -huh. They take your phone good. away from you, your book away from you. I was reading Gone Girl at the time. Oh, they took wow. that away. And all you have is this TV mm -hmm. and your thoughts yep. and what is about to ensue on yeah. this journey. And then they get you all dolled up for night one and they bring you into the lobby of the Sheraton LAX Hotel. Is that right? No, I think at that point we were out at, at Westlake. Okay. Like we okay. were closer to the mansion. Got it. I stand corrected. <laughs> and they like position you in this lobby and then turn you around and you meet like, you know, your limo essentially. Yeah. This, the girls who are in your limo. Yeah. And you were the very first person I met oh. and I will never forget that. Wow. Yeah. And I then we got in the limo and I think I blacked out. Yeah. It, I mean, yeah. Well, for a couple of reasons, because it was so long ago, but also just the adrenaline of all of it. But I also remember meeting you in the lobby and it's like awkward because you're like, are we supposed to talk to one another or do we stay silent? And then you kind of do start talking. And so I remember being in the limo with you and one other gal who didn't make it past night one, but I don't remember who else was in the room. I don't, I have no idea. All I, I remember it's is tough. You. Yeah. And Cause so you had a football. Yes. I remember that. Well, I remember you didn't have the football with you at the time, but I remember your green dress. Yes. The green dress and the football, because all I had to go off of was that he played yeah. college football. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, I don't You're know like, what else this, to do. This will be relatable. <laughs> <laughs> what was your intro? Um, nothing. Like it was so plain Jane. It was just like, I, some, I said something like, I've always imagined how my fairy tale ending would be, but I like, didn't I don't know something like that but I didn't imagine it here with you or so, I don't know Ooh. like so cringe well he obviously remembered because uh. then you got the first one-on-one -on -one. yes <laughs> traveling as a family anytime soon Stoka has all your kids travel gear covered explore their collection of strollers right on suitcases and more 
The Yogo Stroller and Stoka Kids bed box are ready for any adventure. The Yogo Stroller folds and unfolds in a moment, just like a yo-yo. It can be carried over the shoulder and fits into the overhead bin of the plane. Game changer. Most travel agents even know the Yogo Stroller by name. Yogo has stroller solutions from newborn to toddler and even converts into a double stroller with the Yogo Connect. Another favorite is the Stoka Jet Kids bed box that's a premium ride on suitcase. It's a carry on suitcase for children to ride on, be pulled along, or pull themselves. It can carry all of your child's must haves and has an in flight leg rest feature. To learn more, visit stoka.com. You can use promo code travel with Stoka at checkout for a free yo yo travel backpack with a yo yo stroller purchase. That's S T O K K E.com. Promo code travel with Stoka. The yo yo backpack must be added to cart for the promo code to work. And for those who may not know you from The Bachelor and may not follow your social media, can you give them more insight on your disability yeah. and how far you've come from that and yeah. everything you've had to overcome? Okay, so to take it back, I was born without the lower half of my left arm, congenital birth defect called amniotic band syndrome. And growing up, you know, I lived in a super small town where everyone knew who I was. It's like I didn't have to explain myself my peers and classmates just like knew Sarah, that's Sarah, and accepted me for who I was. But I still like, nevertheless, still felt a little othered and different and you can't help but compare yourself to your peers. Um, but then when I moved away to college and left town and moved to San Francisco was kind of like the first eye-opening experience of my life of like, I feel really different from other girls my age. I feel like very intimidated to go to parties or like date. And I suddenly just kind of like closed up. And um, I moved back home for a couple years uh, and then basically shifted around a bunch, landed in LA and I started watching The Bachelor and we would have watch parties and one night, I think it was like Ben Flanick season we were watching. Mm -hmm. And I was like, maybe if I went on The Bachelor, my story would just be out there. And so I wouldn't have to hide anymore. Like kind of similar to being in grade school. People would just know me. And so I wouldn't have to feel like um, embarrassed of my disability or feel like I have to explain myself or hide my arm in photos on dating apps. So this was my rationale is like, I'll go on The Bachelor so that I can date after, like I just won't have to explain myself, if that makes sense. Interesting. I don't think <laughs> I ever knew that. That's like yeah. the thought process that went through your head. Yeah. Because I think even then I just was like, I'll never get chosen. Like it'll never happen for me. I'm never going to be the one he picks. But if I go through this experience, then afterward, if anyone ever wants to date me, they can Google my name and they'll see my photos and I won't have to like explain myself. That was it. I mean, I think that's a shit ton of confidence right there. Yeah. To begin with. <laughs> and what I love, I think what I love most about you and following you, not only because you're a friend and I know you, but because you do exude this authenticity and this confidence about you. And I, has, has that always been there from the beginning? Definitely not. And it's, it's funny that you say that because, you know, even just yesterday, Dylan, my husband, he was working with another content creator and he, and she was like, you know, I've never met Sarah. Like, what's she like? And he was like, well, you'd be surprised. She's actually really introverted. And like, you might not think that from following her on social media. So it's interesting. I definitely feel like maybe I feel more confident, like behind my phone and when I'm like writing online, but Definitely um, in group settings, I, I am introverted. Like in the mansion, I always felt like I was introverted. Maybe it didn't seem that way, but that's how I feel on the inside. Yeah. No, I feel like you just, you exude this confidence <laughs> and this authenticity that pushes me, I think, to even be more authentic. Um, mm, and you, you just, you've taught me so much from that. And then obviously what you put out on social media from your IVF journey to how, how to speak to others going through that yeah. when you're the one who's pregnant and just treat things with such grace and, 
Um, so thanks for that. Oh, yeah. yeah. It's, yeah. and I don't even know if you, it's not your job to educate others, but you do such a good job at it. It's not my job. And I mean, thank you for saying that. But I think the reason I feel inspired to do it is because I have also learned in real time. Like social media is such a wild frontier that we're all figuring out in real time. I mean, there have been times like I learn from you all like I learn from the people who are teaching me on my Instagram how to have conversations with someone who's going through pregnancy loss or infertility or has a disability like so I feel like I'm just kind of regurgitating and amplifying what people are teaching me yeah so it's honestly it's an honor to do it like yeah well thank you from me and thousands of others hundreds of thousands of others I think to take it to take it back a little further, because we just went over like how we met the bachelor mm -hmm. going through that whole scenario and then cut to, I don't know, pre pandemic still when we came. Well, actually, I think it was like right in the dead center. of the Yeah, pandemic. I think we were like in lockdown. We it was yeah. like August or something. Alex and I, I were, we were living in L.A. Yeah. You and Dylan still in Carbondale. Yeah. And we took a little road trip and we came to see y'all. Yeah. And. I think I was seven, eight, nine weeks pregnant with Nora. Yeah. And that was the last time I saw you. Yeah. And so much has come about in both of our lives since then. Mm -hmm. And how long did y'all try until you turned to IVF? Um, we had tried for about six months because as soon as we decided we, were, we wanted to try to have a baby – we went and had what's called a preconception appointment with my OBGYN. I don't know how we got the idea to do this or like who planted the seed, but we're, I don't know, maybe my OBG was like, when you're ready to start trying to have a baby, come have this thing called a preconception appointment with us. So that's the first thing we did. We said, we're ready to start trying. And she was like, okay, great. Try for six months because of your age. I think I was 34 at the time try for six months if no luck come back got it and so we tried for six months nothing like no my cycles are so regular like to the date and there was never any even like blip of my period's late maybe I'm pregnant it was just nothing so at six months I was like let's go back and have a chat with her and so we did like two months of like fertility medication. I think they can give you like Clomid or Femara to help boost ovulation and that didn't work. And so then she was like, let's run tests. And uh, basically immediately was like, yeah, you your AMH is low, your FSH is high, low. I don't remember how it works. And so you have diminished ovarian reserve. You'd be a great candidate for IVF. And probably should just stop trying naturally because it's not going to work. <laughs> that's a that's a that's heavy to hear. Oh yeah, yeah. Did you have any indication from that point on how complex it would be? And no, and I mean, like at that point in time, my perception of IVF at that point in time, my perception of IVF was like that's something you don't have to do until you're like old, like. I just, I, I didn't know anyone who had done IVF. I'm like, this can't be true. Like, what? I'm, I'm only 34. Like, how is that possible? And she literally just gave me some pamphlets and a business card of a IVF doctor in Denver and was like, I can make a referral if you want. And that was basically it. And I went home sobbing because I just felt like I'm broken. This, how could this be happening to me? Dylan's not going to want to stay with me. Like, of course, I had all the self doubt narrative playing of just like, yeah, why would he want to stay with me? We're not married. Now I can't have his kids. Like, he's going to leave. So I had this double whammy of like abandonment issues being stirred up. And then also, like, oh my gosh, I was just told I'm not going to be able to have kids naturally. So I, I never knew at that time, like, what was to come I was just like how am I gonna tell Dylan and like I was only seeing like two feet in front of me at a yeah. time the inner critic is such a bitch yeah Dylan on the other hand is amazing yeah we love Dylan. <laughs> I know I know me too. <laughs> and I don't <laughs> there's no way he 
those thoughts ever crept up in his mind. No. Like he is just, he's such a supportive partner. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. I mean, no, he immediately was just like, I, he, he had to like grieve of course. And was like, yeah, that's not what we expected, but let's do what we need to do. And I do want to dive into some sensitive topics. So I feel like I, I want to get this off my chest. If there's anything you don't want to talk about, yeah, just say it. Totally. Like, yeah. Yeah. I have learned, it's a whole education, IVF. I've learned so much from you. Yeah. I really have. Thank um, you. And you do such a good job just kind of putting it out there online. I know you're not a doctor. Um, <laughs> I, I know you're not. And a lot of people probably almost see you as that. Do you get that? I, that I, pressure? I don't. And I think it's because I've made a really like concerted effort to be like, I am not a doctor. You do a, go- a really good job with those. Yeah. Um, like I, because I've seen a lot of like influencers or like, you know, wellness people who get kind of dragged for trying to offer like medical advice when they definitely shouldn't be. Yeah. So like I said, I try to regurgitate what I've learned from doctors and medical experts, but like every case is so individual. So it's like, I always just try to be like, talk to your own doctor. I know. <laughs> or and here's you, a source. <laughs> you do a really good job yeah. with that because you know, I mean, you are con- a content creator and influencer yeah. as much as we probably both don't like that word. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and you're, you know, we know what is coming our way if yeah. we say the wrong thing, unfortunately. Yeah. Yeah. Cause there's always those people. I think anyone who goes through IVF, we feel like you, like, I feel like I could have my PhD in reproductive endocrinology, but like, I don't, and I would never pretend to. So, um, you learn so much. I mean, it's inevitable. You just like research everything, especially if you're like me, I never thought I'd be someone to be reading like peer review studies, but I do now. And, and so you just like get so enthralled in all of the information that's out there, but no, I Definitely don't want anyone to ever think I'm a doctor. No, I have I great doctors I can recommend you to. <laughs> you do. <laughs> so you go through IVF and you get pregnant. And I remember where I was oh. when you posted that you were pregnant with Oliver. Yeah. And I think I cried with you alongside so many hundreds of thousands of other people out of pure joy and happiness for you. Yeah. I, it, it was such a beautiful moment. I, what was that like? Thank you. Seeing um, that test and and going through that that pregnancy and carrying him. Yeah, there's... So we had been into the IVF maybe like a year at that point. And I think, you know, there's like a, a certain like naivete still of we were just like, woohoo, this is it. Like we're, we, we did it. It worked. And, and so we were like, so thrilled. I've never seen a positive pregnancy test in my life before. So that was just like, so surreal. You like, can't believe your own eyes. And you, you know, I just like, I leaned into it 100%. Like just was like from the get go, this is it. We're out the door, out out to the races, like pregnancy, here we come. And yeah, I shared when I was like, seven weeks pregnant because when you go through IVF and you're sharing the whole thing anyway it's like well the whole world knows you're like waiting on your pregnancy test so you might as well just share so I shared really early and it was just yeah a wild experience of every day being fully present in it the same day I found out I was pregnant I broke my knee and so it was crazy I mean crazy like we found out we were pregnant at 1 p.m and at 3 p.m I fell and broke my knee and same day, we're back at the hospital, same hospital, this time having x-rays. And um, and so basically I was bed rest for the first eight weeks of my pregnancy. And so it forced me to like be present and like really form this connection with Oliver and like reading every book possible and just kind of like, yeah, being pregnant every single day. I completely forgot about that. Yeah. Yeah. Oh my God. <laughs> That's just like another layer. Yeah. So you you carried him until 24 weeks. 24 weeks, yeah. And he was alive for about 20 minutes. Yeah. Tell us about him. And I mean, truly, he was such a beautiful baby. Yeah. He really was. Thank you for sharing all of that. Mm-hmm. Him, the photos, and yeah. what... 
I, I guess what what do you want his legacy to be? I mean, it was like I think the most surreal thing about delivering Oliver and getting to see him and hold him was just like I wasn't expecting him to like already have features like mm-hmm. have Dylan's features and my features and and so being able to see that I was I was just like so grateful and the hospital had this amazing doula that was provided to us through a nonprofit called Walk With Me. I'd love to give them a shout out. Mm-hmm. They're Colorado based. And so she was there and she was like, do you want us to take photos of baby Oliver? And at first I was kind of like, I don't know, it seems kind of strange, but I'm so glad she did because it, I have those mementos like frozen forever now of like what Oliver looked like and and what it felt like to spend just a brief amount of amount of time with him. And, you know, sorry, I forgot what your, what your original I, question I asked was. a lot of questions at once just um, because it's it's a lot. And I, I just, I'm yeah. so curious and I'm so glad you're yeah. so willing to sit here in front of me and talk about it. Yeah. I think, what I guess, what was it like to spend that time with him? Yeah. And, and what do you want his legacy to be? Oh, yeah, the legacy. I don't know, like, as soon as I came home and I wrote this, like, almost you know, tribute, eulogy to Oliver on my Instagram. I was like, I don't know what his legacy is, but he's going to be larger than life. Like Mm -hmm. I had no idea at the time. And I just felt though, like in that brief moment we had with him at the hospital, it was like this little boy, although his time was shortly lived, like it was with meaning and purpose and impact and like something about his brief time on earth was for a reason to to reach people to maybe you know reach other moms through pregnancy loss or IVF like I just felt like there there was purpose for his little spirit to come down um, even if super shortly lived purpose in the pain yeah for sure I mean so I think you've he has undoubtedly helped so many people through you. Yeah. I mean, I felt like very heavy into spirituality after losing Oliver. Um, I had never been really a spiritual person. I'm not a religious person. I like, you know, I go to yoga and I like have dabbled with meditation, but it never really like clicked with me. And then I just needed something to help me with the healing so bad. And like spirituality and consciousness, like exploring that really just helped me heal. And so I did get really deep into like, yeah, believing in spirit babies and that he had purpose. And, you know, and like, I think being able to channel him through me and through writing on Instagram, like there was a couple months there where it was just like, I, I just felt like I could write for days about him. And yeah, I don't know. So it's like I never knew what his legacy could be. I don't know what it will be, but I think it had a plan of its own already. I think it's just becoming. Yeah. Like it's just unfolding as time goes on. I think I know you are such a beautiful writer. Thank you. Before all, like pre Oliver, pre pregnancy, mm-hmm. pre all of this. Thank um, you. you already were. I mean, you have a blog and newsletters and all of that. Um, it's interesting what comes out further when you are introduced to such pain, I think, and, and how it flows out of you even more. So I think when you're in such a fragile state, Mm -hmm. um, and, and how it's able to help others. But I I feel like that's why, you know, all of these artists, you know, also kind of like, yeah, self-destruct too, because they kind of, and all very different, um, and you know, experiences, but like you, they, they like seem to need to hang on to like all of this, you know, pain and self-destructiveness in order to create their art. Mm -hmm. But I feel like when it's put upon you and you put it out into the world, I mean, it just flows beautifully. And I think there is so much purpose in that pain and you are helping so many people. Yeah. And I also think hu- pain humanizes us mm-hmm. and it really helps, you know, to have other people. You're just so, you're so relatable through it. And it's, do you feel like 
your experiences and these milestones have inundated you with various people, DMs, emails, messages, engagement, social media numbers. Not that Mm -hmm. that was ever the point, Mm -hmm. but it seems like so many more people are finding you. Yeah. And you're not, you're not just a, you know, reality star. Yeah. I would say it it is a funny thing. Like, um, because there was a huge like boost in followers when I lost Oliver and that might have been a little bit of like the sensationalism like people are just it's it's the psychology of of human nature like you want to you want to like see some something that's happening for someone that maybe you've been through or that you can relate to and so I think like there was this huge influx of women who would experienced pregnancy loss or infant loss um or IVF who were exposed to my channel for the first time. And so it is weird to be like, oh, now there's all these new people here that are here because I lost my son. But because of it, like the women I have met now through social media are, it's so much like I feel so aligned to I hate saying like followers but or audience like because to me it, it is a community but like I feel so aligned with the people who are there on my channel who I'm engaging with every single day total strangers but I'm like yeah. we get each other yes. it's like an un- unspoken language and yes. so I'm grateful for how people showed up but maybe just like circumstantially it's obviously not I right know. <laughs> you weren't seeking that out yeah <laughs> but it's so true I feel like um when very different experiences but when I was going through my double mastectomy I was just like I mean I can't travel might as well just put this out there yeah. um as content and if it can help one person great like I've done my job and the the amount that other people complete strangers helped me heal mm-hmm. is indescribable Um, and that's one of the reasons I will forever love social media. Yeah. Yeah. Like there's a woman out there who I don't even know her real name, but like, I know her Instagram handle, but like, she was the one that was like, one day she said to me, she was like, your deepest, darkest thoughts did not cause your pregnancy loss. Mm -hmm. And that will stick with me for life. Like I think of that all the time and I'm like, I've never even met this person, you know, it's just, it's crazy. So yeah. Uh, yeah, it's definitely, I've seen some really positive outcome from the social media side of all of this. And, and that's why sometimes I'm like, maybe Oliver's little spirit, you know, I think he was actually probably like a very wise old spirit, but I'm like, maybe he was just like using me. Like, I'm just like this channel that he came through and is like, she has like an Instagram following. I'm going to go like convey this message. I don't know. It's the places your brain goes when you're trying to make well, sense. Well, I, I, I really have to say I loved when you dove into the woo-woo. Yeah. Because I, I love woo-woo. Yeah. And I know you're, you had purpose behind that and you're trying to find meaning. But I believe in all that stuff. Yeah. Wholeheartedly. Yeah. Like when I was in that um, store in New Zealand thinking of you. Yeah. You know, it was like a crystal shop. And I was like, oh, I want to get, I want to get Sarah some crystals. Yeah. I ended up yeah. getting you something else. But I love that you dove into that world. Yeah, it's fun. And I mean, it's, I do think it's like when you go through a life-changing experience like this, it does initiate you into a higher level of consciousness of mm-hmm. like, you see people with like greater compassion. And it doesn't mean that if you haven't struggled or haven't been through something that you aren't compassionate or you aren't like aware of people but it's just like it allows you to move through life thinking a little bit like broader picture and um and so yeah I leaned into the woo-woo I went on yoga retreats I saw yes. every Reiki healer yes. in town like yes. and it was fun yes. you know it, gi- it gives you connection to something higher well speaking of connection because didn't you also meet with somebody who you could speak to Rio through. <laughs> yeah. So, okay. And Rio's also Sarah's dog. Yes. Who you rescued from the yes. same rescue center when we visited best, Zion together. Yep. Best friends, animal sanctuary. Yes. In uh, shout out. Utah. Yes. They're amazing. If you're going to adopt or rescue, yes. go there. Yeah. You guys got to volunteer. We did. Yeah. Largest no-kill animal shelter in the U.S. Oh, wow. Yeah, they're great. Yeah. We got Rio there right after you and I were in Zion. 
Dylan and I left the trip. We were like, should we go to the animal shelter and just like see what they have? And of course, that's, you know, that's never <laughs> a good idea. And you left with the dog. <laughs> yeah, and we left with the dog, the yeah. best dog. Yeah. So this was completely unrelated to Oliver, but we, same timing, the week before Oliver died, we went on a trip to Bend, Oregon to visit Dylan's family. And we left Rio with a dog sitter who we've left him with multiple times before. Not a big deal. And the day we got to Bend, a huge blizzard hit Colorado. And the dog sitter called and said, Rio ran away. Like, sorry. It was the weirdest thing. He was like, your dog got out. He ran away. I don't know what you want me to do about it. It's blizzarding outside. I can't go look for him. And we were like, what do you mean you can't go look for him? Like, you're the dog sitter. Like, anyway. So I was freaking (gasps) out. Oh, my God. I was freaking out. 23 weeks pregnant, hysterical, calling our neighbors. I called the radio station. I wrote on the Facebook group, like, dog, my dog is missing. If anyone sees him, Blasting please bring it. him inside. Yeah. And sure enough, he ended up running home. He ran across town, crossed the highway, and got to our house. And he was on our front doorstep when our neighbor went over to go look for him. So when we came home, I was like, I want to hire a pet medium communicator to chat Got with it. Rio because like why did he run away we've left him with the dog sitter many times yeah. I was very confused so I hired this pet medium and it was remarkable I kept everything completely anonymous I didn't want her to know my name yeah. my email I did yeah. like an alias email yes and all she wanted was a photo of the dog and it was over the phone and we all we put it on speakerphone she connects with the dog and for like the first 15 minutes you sit in silence and then she's like okay uh, once I've communicated with Rio I'll come back on the phone and tell you like what we talked about so it's kind of crazy wild and she's like he the gist of why he ran away was he thought something was wrong he thought something had happened she was like are are you pregnant or expecting a baby because he thought something was wrong he thought you guys maybe like went to the hospital and didn't tell him. And so my mind was just like, what? That's wild. Because yeah. then the following week, Ugh. we did go to the hospital. And so that just, I mean, that gives me like full body Same. chills thinking about it because it was just too weird. Um, and so that's why he ran home. He was concerned. But beyond that, it was like... He, She described to a T, she could describe the interior of our apartment, the exterior of our apartment, our furniture, um, my coat that I walk Rio in in the winter and said that like he is connected to me by a cord, a red cord at the stomach. And if anyone knows how I walk Rio, I tie my leash around my waist. What? And it's a red leash. Okay, this is bizarre. Yeah, and it, so it was just like so crazy. So that to me, I was like, okay, if you don't believe in like mediumship, call this lady. Your DMs are probably going to blow up after this because everyone's <laughs> going to be like, we want Sarah's pet medium. But it was wild. You took the words out of my mouth. Truly, if you... If this doesn't make you believe yeah. in that world, yeah. I, I, I yeah. can't help you. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> and so at the end of the call, you know, another reason I had scheduled it was because Rio had been showing signs of aggression during my last pregnancy. Every time I would take him on a walk, it didn't matter. The dog, he would like get super protective and aggressive and he was getting in a lot of dog fights and it was making me really nervous because I mean, these were like real dog fights mm-hmm. where they would like have their mouths, you know, mm-hmm. on each other. And I was scared to walk him anymore. Mm-hmm. And so the pet medium said, you know, like, why are you doing this? And Rio said something like, I am worried she can't protect herself because of her arm and I need to like be her protector. And this woman doesn't know you. Doesn't know us. And, um, and so basically she was like, do you want me to say anything back to him? And we were like, yes, can you please tell him he doesn't need to worry? Like I can protect myself. I don't need him to, you know, get into dog fights over me. And then, and tell him like, you know, basically we were just like, we're, everything's okay. <laughs> like, oh like, don't worry so much about us. And but he had yeah. this wild premonition. Yeah. 
So crazy. It really and she is. described it like he's describing you pushing a stroller with a little baby in a bassinet and like you're wearing a denim jacket and you it's like you're in the mountains, but it's not snowing out. And we were just like, this is so trippy. I have full body goosebumps. Yeah. And I mean, what a what a dog. I uh, I'll never forget <laughs> the real Instagram story photo. I don't know what it was, but I have this image of my head of when you went to pick up Oliver's ashes. Yes. And Rio's there. Yeah. And he's just like an angel on your shoulder. Yeah. Yeah. Because the day I got called to pick up the ashes was kind of wild. I wasn't expecting it. I was like out doing errands. Um, and they called maybe like three or four days early. And they were like, we have Oliver's remains ready if you'd like to come pick them up. And it was kind of just like, yeah, like I'll go. Like I'm not, I'm here, I'm driving, I'll go right now. And I just went and Rio was with me. And so when I got back in the car, I don't know, I just felt like I needed to have Rio like smell the box Mm -hmm. that it came in so that he could understand. You know, they say with pets, like you should let your pet try and, I, I mean, I've heard even in instances like, just like see death so that they understand that the person has gone. And so I just wanted him to like see the box that Oliver's ashes were in so that he could understand what was happening. And it was weird because in that video he was like, you can just tell he's like a little aware of something that's happening. Like just solemn. Yeah. 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 It was strange. Well, like I said, I, 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 remember where I was when you shared that news yeah. about your pregnancy. And I remember where I was when you shared the news that you had lost him and he had left this earth. Yeah. And oh, it's just, I'm sorry. Thanks. I'm sorry, friend. Yeah. Like I just, I, my heart goes out to you. You've been through so much and you continue to handle all of these experiences with so much grace mm-hmm. You really do. I don't, I'm not that you want to yeah, or you have to, you just, you do. Mm -hmm. And it's remarkable to see and see you a year later, like on that day in February of last year, Mm -hmm. did you think there was ever a chance that you'd be here a year later with two in your belly? Um, no, because when you experience loss like that, like you're not even thinking about it. You just yeah. want your baby back. Like mm. you aren't thinking, I want to get pregnant again or like let's start again. Like you're just confused. Like mm. why did this happen to us? How can I bring him back? I mean, for the longest time, I didn't even want to see the season changing mm. because like, see you know I wrote a post about this like seeing the trees budding was this like very harsh reality that time was separating me from Oliver and so no I never thought like oh in a year maybe I'll be pregnant again I just wanted to be back on January 28th Mm. 2023 with Oliver forever you know but then I would say around and then I had complications because I had retained placenta never stopped bleeding, couldn't figure out why, ended up having to have surgery again five, three months after delivering him. And so it was a solid like five months before I got my cycle back, before my body was starting to heal. And then I started to feel like, okay, let's start again with IVF. But emotionally, like now hindsight, I don't think I was ready. It was just the physical need to be pregnant again. So we went through with an IVF cycle and it didn't work. But now knowing what I know, like I, I wasn't ready, like maybe physically, but not mentally. So. But any regrets? No, I think I did what I needed to do. I processed in this the steps, mm-hmm. like I took the steps that we needed to do and take. I think there's always like regret around losing embryos because you feel like, they're so precious, not regret that you used them, but you just start to feel like your chances are depleting each time mm. an embryo transfer does not work. And so it's like you lose Oliver and then you're losing embryos and you just start to feel like that window is really closing for you. And so by October of last year, you know, we were 
done. Like we had two mosaic embryos left, which I can talk about what that means. But I mean, Mm. to me, I was like, oh, we're done. We're out of embryos. And I was preparing mentally to envision either a child-free life or pursuing alternative paths. I am. I don't know, and I can't speak for you, but I imagine you'll look back at 2023, yeah, as a one of the craziest years of your life, yeah, with so many ups and so many downs, yeah, and you also got married, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you yes. got married to Dylan, yeah, and we we kind of had a similar timeline there too, where. Alex, my husband, proposed right before, right before the world shut down. Yeah. And I don't think y'all were so far after that. So you were in, you got engaged in March or February. February. Yeah. And we got engaged in May. Yeah. Yeah. And so trying to plan maybe a wedding, but there are still so many question marks. You're in the middle of the pandemic. We get pregnant in the middle of the pandemic you were in the middle of IVF in a pandemic. And so there are just so many questions Yeah, and it leads you to a grand Canyon ceremony. Yeah. Yeah. We, so this was August. It had been eight months since losing Oliver and we won lottery tickets to raft the grand Canyon, which is like a once in a lifetime deal. Yeah, absolutely. Anyone can go on the grand Canyon. You can like sign up to go with an outfitter, yeah. but to get your own permit to host your own self-supported trip is truly once in a lifetime. Right. So we get the permit and what was that call like? Um, <laughs> well they call Dylan and they're like, you got a backup lottery. Like it means someone else declined it. And so it goes down the list. Got it. And so he got it and they so the national park service calls you and they're like you have 30 minutes to decide what? and then we call the next person and so it's like a designated weekend you have to commit you have to make your deposit like immediately and so he's <laughs> oh like okay God. i have to ask my wife like we were planning on doing ivf only or my fiance let me chat and he's like do you want to go and Initially, I was like, no, because I was so tunnel vision. I was like, we're doing IVF. Like, no, I don't want to get derailed. And he was like, let's just take a month. Let, like, let's go do it. It'll be good for us. So we call he the parks ranger calls back and we're like, okay, fine. Sign us up. We're doing it. We've yes. always wanted to do this. Yay. And we said yes and put the trip together in a couple weeks. And, and then I was like, maybe we should just elope while we're down there. You know, I wasn't really inspired to host a big wedding. I, that tunnel vision, I just was like, I just want to get pregnant again. Let's just do IVF. I don't want to spend money on a wedding. So we decided if it works, we'll take some stuff down there to elope. But if it doesn't work, like no pressure. And it all just kind of worked out perfectly and the weather was good. And we were like, let's just do it and get it over with. I'll never forget (laughs) you about to leave for that trip and you posted yeah. like the wedding dress in your doorway. Yeah. I feel like a stalker because I, I feel like <laughs> I know every single Instagram post you've ever done, but I swear I'm just a friend. Thank you. No, I know yours too though. We can, we can switch they just, roles. They just so they just stand out. Yeah. So that was your idea. Yes. Well, I think it was probably both of us. Yeah. Like we had always talked about like doing something in adventure elopement. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so literally two weeks before we left, I ordered a quick dress online. I got a veil on Amazon and, and then I made this banner that said just married, like hand painted banner. And I was like, we'll bring it just in case. And I then love it. We'll see. It's so you and yeah. so Dylan. And now that it's over, yeah, I'm like, oh my God, it was so us. I would never do it any other way. But again, life throws you a curveball on that trip. Yes. <laughs> because like two days after the elopement, I ate shit in a rapid. Sorry, I hope yeah, I can swear. Totally. On here. Do you know Alex, yeah. the Australian? <laughs> and tore my MCL. And we still had 10 days left of this river trip. How did you navigate that? Um, I wanted to be evac'd out. Yeah. Like I was just like, are you kidding me? Like yeah. I broke my leg last year and now I have, I torn MCL in the grand freaking Canyon. Right. Like how am I going to get through these rapids? If you're familiar with the grand Canyon, like, I mean, it's world-class, the biggest rapids in the United States. Like I, I was just freaking out. I would have peed myself. Yeah. 100%. And, but the but group you knew was what you great. Were doing. Yeah. The group was like, we'll help you. If anything's like so, so scary, we'll carry you around the rapid. 
Well, turns out you can't walk around any rapids. You just got to go through it. You just got to go through it. And I just sat arms linked with Dylan's parents. I sat in between them. I felt like such a little kid. I'm like, I feel horrible for making like Dylan's 70 year old parents sit on the outside of the raft with me being like this, but they were, they were great. They were just, like, I didn't know they came. Yeah. That's they so came. fun. Yeah. And I just closed my eyes and like held on for dear life through the rest of the rapids. So when you look back on that trip, it was it epic. Was it ups and downs? Oh was my God. No, like torn MCL included best trip ever like best trip ever I can't recommend it enough if anyone gets the opportunity like you have to you have to raft the green so how do you even put your name in for a pass like that so if you have river experience guiding experience well you don't have to have guiding experience but you definitely have to have experience rowing got it and and trip leading um like not no one's gonna check your credentials or anything but you should have experience because it's it's big water it's like serious um so all you have to do is go to i think just like national parks got it so it's a simple online just like throw your name in the hat you apply for the permit Yeah. yeah and the way to do it if you're like serious about it you know you have to apply every year um, and it's like $15 or something. Don't quote me on that. But you you put your name into the lottery every year. And then the way it works is like over time, I think you get closer and closer. So it's kind of one of those things you get kind of like grandfathered in. I don't know. I don't, I don't have that kind of experience. You are definitely more adventurous than me. Like I definitely <laughs> want to be like you, but I just... Oh, this was wild. Yeah. It was wild. And we experienced a flash flood. Our entire camp washed away. I mean, it was, you're, it is wild and like not for the faint of heart. Was it one of those trips though that you, in the moment, you're like, F this. Oh, yeah. But then you needed a, you need a minute for it to become a memory. Yeah. And then you look back and you're like, God, that was awesome. Type two fun. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> like yeah. you, we did not really relax and have fun when we had fun the whole time, but we didn't relax until you get through Lava Falls, which is the biggest rapid. And that is on like day 11 or something. It's towards the end. So you got married before that. Yeah. Got it. So the whole trip, you're kind of puckered. Like yeah, you're just yeah, like, yeah. I'm scared every day. On like you're seat. very on the edge of your seat. Every, all the captains of the boats are like, you know, they got their game face on. You got to be on your best game. Um, and then once you get to that point, you're like, okay, now we can like crack all the beers. Let's like have fun. You're doing somersaults off the cliffs and it's great. Like I said, yeah. handle life in all its curveballs with so much grace. <laughs> you, you really do. I admire you Thank so you. much. I really do. Thank you. Is married life any different? It is. Yeah. I think it's a lot different. How so? Gosh. Well, I think the biggest difference initially was like, oh, wow. We're really, like, I was surprised I was the one that had the feelings of like, oh my God, we're like committed. Yeah. Like what? Like, yeah. I don't know. I just had a hard time with that at first. And then it really started to hit me that like, oh no, All of his problems are my problems. All my problems are his problems. Like we, you know, finances is kind of a big one. Like we kept our finances pretty separate Mm -hmm. up until marriage. And then we blended things. And then you just, you know, it changed. And so I think that is what's different. But, you know, now in arguments, there's less like fear. He's going to leave me. Like no way. um, Yeah. So it. The commitment's there. It's It's the commitment that makes it feel a lot different. But the day-to-day is exactly the same. Yeah. (laughs) I think that's a great way to put it. Yeah. The the finance is the legality of it, which is so interesting. It's like, yeah, you signed a piece of paper. Yeah. But a lot comes with that signature. Yeah. I started to get really scared because... Um, you know, Dylan has a startup business and I was like, oh wait, now like if something ever happens with your business, it affects me. And so that it did just the legality of it makes it feel a lot more intimidating than when you're just dating and cohabitating. But again, I feel like there's so much synergy between y'all and us as a couple and how we work together and live yeah. together and love one another is a lot I know under the same roof yeah <laughs> I know it's crazy like both Alex and Dylan are in the photo world and adventure world in and the carpenter world yeah very handyman yeah how do you handle that like is it I th- I, I just think it's a rarity yeah. to be able to do that with another person um do so much with that person I don't think yeah. a lot of people can do it yeah 
Um, okay, this is a really interesting topic because especially right now where we are in life with babies on the way, we and like we don't own a home. We're renters. Um, we don't we don't have like a ton of financial support. We have no financial support actually from parents or family members. And so I think we're in this like phase where we're kind of like comparing ourselves a lot to our peers of like, well, we should have a house by now. We should have X, Y, and Z. But because of the nature of like our businesses and our creativity and our lifestyle, I do feel, I feel rich. Mm -hmm. Like I feel rich in experiences and that like Dylan and I get to spend every day together and yeah, he has to go to work and sometimes we don't see each other for like two weeks. Like you guys probably go stretches and it's weird and every day is different, but you know, I think I just, I feel rich in the life that we're creating together. I resonate with that so hard because it is, it's a blessed life. You and I have seen so much, uh, traveling nomads. Yeah. Our, our lifestyle is very unique and I think it's easy to get into the rut of comparing yourself to somebody who just bought that big house down the road or is like redecorating and you look around and you're like, well, should we do that? And you, yeah. you almost succumb to the consumerism of yeah. it all. Yeah. Even coming here yeah. on this, uh, you know, we're doing this episode from Vail, Colorado, mm-hmm. skiing. And I'm like, I haven't had new ski clothes in years. Well, first of all, I needed more in this postpartum phase, yeah. new ones in this postpartum phase. And I was like, Alex, don't let me tempt you with this consumerism. Cause he was, he, all of a sudden he was like, well, maybe I should buy new clothes. Yeah. And then he went to his closet. He came out and he was like, I have a perfect jacket and a perfect pair of pants and they fit me fine. And I'm like, yeah, yeah. don't let me tempt you into this consumerism. Like, yeah, don't it, you. And he was like, I'm content. Mm-hmm. I'm like, yeah, just needs to be reminded. Sometimes. Totally. Yeah. And, and I think like entering into the new parent phase is, is a, is like a real splash of cold water in the face for a lot of people because you know, Instagram and here it is it's like so strange that you and I are in this space but like Instagram makes it seem like you have to have the per- perfect aesthetic home with like the white home with the nursery and and like the reality is like we're probably not going to have a nursery like uh, we don't have the space and where we live and where we choose to live like that's not a reality for us and and so it is hard to to see what you consume and how that impacts your life and what you, and like what you think you need versus what you have and want well, and then <laughs> or I, what you think you want. And then I think about, you know, so many other people like we, and, and so many others do so almost like so much more with so much less. Yeah. And I'm like, it's a blessed life. Yeah, I know. Like right now I, I'm trying to remind myself, okay, think of how like Europeans do it or think of really how any nation besides America yes. raises two children in a small two bedroom house. Like obviously we can do it. So can totally do I'm it. trying to look at a lot of like Euro inspo for yeah. small space living. Yeah, for sure. Can, <laughs> it can be done. Yeah. I'm excited to follow along again. I know. And note every single Instagram you post because I'm a stalker. Um, <laughs> So to kind of go follow along your journey in chronological order, you got married in August, yeah? Yeah. August. Yeah. And obviously still very much healing from Oliver's loss and for I, I imagine forever will. Yeah. And uh, you find out you're pregnant. Yes. When was that? Well, we did. So we came off the Grand Canyon and then we did do another round of IVF, which again did not work. And that was October. And so then we were like, okay, this is our last ditch effort. Yep. Um, we have two mosaic embryos left. And essentially, like, my perception of mosaic embryos at the time was that they're, like, not good embryos. They're kind of your, like, bottom-of-the-barrel embryos is what I thought. And so I was like, well, it's all we have left. Let's throw them in. Mm-hmm. see what sticks mm-hmm. and if not like this will if they don't stick like I'm at peace that this could be the end of our mm-hmm. IVF journey mm-hmm. and so I learned more about I, um, mosaic embryos as we were preparing and I started meeting with genetic counselors and like 
just trying to understand, oh, that these are actually very viable embryos. They're just as good as euploid embryos. They, it's just the difference is when they went in for genetic testing, there's like a little bit of the cells that got tested came back potentially abnormal. So if you think of a soccer ball, mm. Imagine a completely white soccer ball would be what's called a euploid embryo, okay. meaning it's genetically normal as far as they can tell, okay. as far as their testing goes. And then a mosaic embryo would be the soccer ball that has black patches on it. So it just means that there's, when they did the biopsy, some of the cells came back slightly abnormal. When they're biopsying embryos, they're testing the outer cells of the embryo. Got it. And the outer cells of the embryo are what become the placenta. They're not the cells that become the fetus. And so this testing isn't diagnostic. It's just, it's like a screening. It's genetic screening, essentially. But it is really helpful in determining, is this embryo, does it have a good chance of being an, a euploid embryo or does it is it like are all the patches black is it most likely going to be an abnormal embryo that would result in miscarriage so the the testing is still really important and it's really um, an informative tool in IVF so when you get a mosaic embryo what I've learned is that like they're not throwaways <laughs> they're not no, no. bottom of the barrel it just means that their testing wasn't as conclusive so we transferred both of them. And like I said, I was pretty burnt out at that point. And mm. so that was why I was like, let's just do two. Like, it's more efficient. Like probably like if we're lucky, one will stick. And both of them stuck. <laughs> and so we found out a week, you know, eight days after our transfer that I was pregnant with twins. And now I'm 18 weeks pregnant with twins. Yay! Congratulations. Yeah. yeah what was you. it, of course, what was it like, I guess, first of all, seeing that, that pregnancy test for a second time in your life. Yeah. And then going into that doctor's appointment. Yeah. Okay. So in IVF, you do your transfer and then depending on your doctor, you'll have to do a pregnancy test via blood work Got first okay. because- you're, there isn't enough HCG to, to show up on a pregnancy test okay. always. So you go in for a couple rounds of blood work. So we got our first pregnancy test confirmed by blood. And then this, they want to see the numbers rising every like 48 hours or so. So you go back for another test and my numbers were rising and we're like, oh my gosh, this is great. Like I'm pregnant, but still you don't know if it is one or two. And but my numbers were like average. They weren't like you would think twins would be like insanely high number of HCG mm -hmm, in mm -hmm. your um, blood, but it was just normal. And then we went in for the ultrasound, the very first ultrasound. Oh, and I will say I, I did pee on a stick because I was like, I just want to see what yeah. uh, feel it again. And the pink line came back so strong. Like they call it they call it a uh, line stealer in pregnancy world where like there's so much HCG in your urine at this point, it's now stealing the dye from the test line yeah. or the control line. And like, Oh yeah. Yeah. Okay. So did you have any indication at that point or were you just like, no. wow. Okay. I was just like, we're pregnant. Yeah. I'm just like every day I'm like repeating to myself today. I'm pregnant today. I'm pregnant. Mm. But like, we have no idea what or how many. Sure. And then by, I think I went in at six weeks for my very first confirmation ultrasound mm -hmm. and we're watching the monitor and there's baby on the screen and she's like, there's the heartbeat, heartbeats measuring, great, da, 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 da. And I don't know, I didn't even want to say anything. I think I was just kind of like, just let it be what it is. Or I don't know, I was just mute. <laughs> and then Dylan was like, okay, so we actually transferred two embryos. Can We just want to make sure that there aren't two babies in there. And she was like, oh, let's see. And like ever so slightly adjusted the ultrasound wand and was like, boop, there's baby B. Oh like gosh. right next to baby A. And she was the same size. Her heartbeat was flickering. And, and we were like, oh, my God, we're having twins. <laughs> it was insane. I mean, what goes through your head? <sighs> Truthfully... I was 
shocked. Like, you know, okay, we're transferring two embryos. There's a chance you're going to have twins. I never actually thought we would have twins. And so I feel like I had the same shock that anyone who's finding out they have twins. Yeah. So I was just like, what? Like, how are we going to do this? I just remember laying there watching and being like, oh, my God, oh, my God, oh, my God, over and over. How are we going to do this? How are we going to afford it? Like, two of everything. Like, how are we going to raise two kids? How am I going to hold two kids with one hand? Like, I, you know, my mind went a million places. And I'm not going to lie, the first trimester was really, was tough. I was like, I don't know that this is what I signed up for. Like, I actually, I'm so grateful and this is what I wanted. But like, can I do it? I don't know. And all those feelings are so valid. Yeah. So I would say IVF or not, you still yeah. have the same like, oh my God, twins or multiples or however many it hits you. Really yeah, I, can't, I, I don't know. Like I've never been there. I yeah. Thanks for sharing. Like I, to be in the mind of, of yeah. somebody who experienced that. Do you feel different with this pregnancy than with your first with Oliver? Physically, it's very different. With Oliver, I was very sick. Uh, my first trimester was rough. I was on bed rest for a broken leg. Like yeah. everything was different. This pregnancy has been very physically mild, very mild symptoms. The fatigue is out of this world, but I never really got too sick. But I will say now within the last like two weeks, I just popped and like the expansion feels very rapid and fast and and it's uncomfortable and like I never got to a point with Oliver where I was uncomfortable mm -hmm. even at end of 24 weeks and I'm 18 weeks now and I'm uncomfortable already so I think twins it's just like everything's a little yeah. expedited yeah but, expedited for sure yeah and you you know it is your second pregnancy yeah um, and your body, I think, responds to that differently from your first. Yeah. Um, it's just, it's so wild. I'm, I am very happy for you. Yeah. I, I, I imagine so many thoughts are going through your head. And I truly, I, I think about you, Sarah, almost every day. From just wondering how you're doing to thinking about you when I'm taking care of my own baby. I have a four-month-old. And so I think about you when I'm carrying her. Yeah. And you are so able-bodied. Like I've seen you do so much with your disability. Like mm -hmm. it's, it's so incredible. Thank you. How do you think you'll navigate with twins and your one arm? I know Dylan's such a support system, Yeah. but how do you think you'll navigate it? I think, you know, so many people are like, you'll just figure it out. You'll figure it out. You've figured everything else out. You'll figure it out. And, and I do, agree with that sentiment to an extent. Like, I think I will be very resilient. I will figure out how to do bottles and we'll, we'll figure things out. And I think there's going to be a limit. I watched you in the past week or two go to this conference yeah. and it was so cool to watch you put on the carrier yeah. with one hand and pick up the baby from the crib with one hand. Yeah. Like, I think you are amazing. Thank you. And I know you can do it. Yeah. I, but I imagine like all these thoughts go through your head on now pregnant with two, mm -hmm. like how different that will be. Yeah. I think, I think to just put a blanket statement, like I'll figure it out. We'll figure it out. Kind of denies my real reality that like there might be some things I can't figure out. Mm. There might be some things that I can't do without a second person's assistance. You know, the things that are immediately crossing my mind right now are like, we live on the third story of an apartment with no elevator. Like I can't carry two babies up the stairs at the same time. Um, I'm going to have to take two trips or just things like that. Um, breastfeeding, <sighs> getting both babies latched. You know, it's, I think it's going to require a lot of assistance. Dylan is totally up for the job and we're just trying to forecast as best as we can right now. Like maybe it will mean, Dylan has to play more of a stay home role with me or we'll have to hire a nanny or like an au pair. Like I don't even know because yeah. those are also financial things that we don't have money for. But we're just trying to figure it out. Like there are just some realities, you know, and, and it crosses my mind and I have to grieve it all the time. I thought today like while I was doing my hair and I was like, 
kind of swaying with the babies in my belly, like, you know, when my girls are Nora's age, like, I won't be able to hold both of them at the same time. And that's something I'll have to grieve, but there's going to be different ways that I have that connection with them. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. And I yeah. think like anything, I think the first years will be tough and yeah. it'll be a challenge. And then like with Nora being three, like there, the challenges just get different mm -hmm. as the kids get older. Yeah. And I didn't, I'm just figuring it out in real time because she's, she's my first, but it's interesting how, yeah, some things get easier yeah. while some things get harder as they grow up and older. Yeah. I and think, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Once, once the babies have like autonomy on one thing, yeah. there will be like a new complication yeah, in a different I way. So <laughs> I think, you know, it'll just, I'm viewing it as seasons and we'll take each season as it comes. When I did go to the pregnancy expo, a lot of the women there were so helpful in helping me like consider problem solving. Like, well, maybe you'll have to you know, baby wear one baby and push the other in the stroller. Like it was just kind of helping me come up with ways. And I think it's just going to be trial and error. Yeah. For it is ever. It is. And that's life. <laughs> yeah. That's life. And I, yeah. it's been a joy to be your friend and watch you the past 12 years conquer so many things. Thank you. And I know this will be no different. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and I'm up for the challenge, right? Like you always have yeah. been. I, tr I truly, admire you thank you leslie i really oh, really do thank um, you thank you for being here thank you for driving an hour and a half to come <laughs> talk and hang My and pleasure. catch up this awesome hotel oh. i mean it's like a vacation for me so yeah <laughs> Thank you for everything. I mean, truly, I could go on and on. Like, yeah. I feel like we have in, endless things, limitless things to talk about. Limitless. But <laughs> I know. Well, and, and on that note, someday, I'm just going to plant this seed right now. I would love, you know, I'm in the very, like, kind of beginning stages of getting She Lift back in a yes. place. Yes. We're always very ambitious of me to do when I'm pregnant. But um, I, I would still love to do, like, a collaborative retreat let's someday. talk let's speak it into existence yeah, right yeah. here right now we'll truly because i know we talked about doing something together along the way like from years yeah. past and yeah. so i think it's it was put into the making like years ago and we just need yeah. to like finish it yeah we I will know. yeah we'll take them but it's, it's wild how like do you feel like pregnancy you get like these wild hairs of creativity um oh that's a good question i think no. Because <laughs> you, you were like, well, I, I, this is ambitious, but I want to bring She Lift back. And so I thought maybe like there was a wild hair of creativity there. No, I've been trying to get She Lift back in a good place for a while. The reason when COVID hit, we lost our executive director mm -hmm. and then we were on hiatus. Will you tell everybody a little bit more about She Lift for yeah. those who may have not yeah, heard of it? Yeah, yeah, totally. Um, so She Lift is an organization that I started after appearing on Bachelor in Paradise that helps young women, so typically like anywhere young girl age to like early 20s with disabilities, discover confidence and self-esteem in the outdoors. So I really wanted to be able to take women skiing, hiking, rock climbing, camping, like teaching them that despite their differences despite their abilities they were still just as capable and deserving of being a world-class rock climber if they wanted to and so I started the organization and hosted a, a series of retreats for girls and young women and then COVID hit and everything got shut down and then I was kind of like in a bad head place about it well, let's resurrect it I think yeah. you're so remarkable you started that Tents Without Gents, where you take women camping. Yeah. The infertile circle, <laughs> which is very different, but still bringing that community of women together, yeah. which I think can be a challenge. And you do it, you seem to do it so effortlessly. Thank you. Um, you just, you're a great facilitator. You're a great storyteller, a great writer, and uh, just a great Thank advocate you. for so many things. I've always felt like I have a knack for bringing women together I might not be like the expert I might not be the the teacher of the things but like I like bringing the women together and then either bringing in experts or partners to help do the 
you're damn the good at it. Thing. <laughs> I think we gotta we have to do something together. Yeah, on no, that front. we will. We yeah. got it. We'll start. We'll take suggestions from all of you if you have ideas on like location or anything like I that. I mean, truly, when you think about it, that's how we met. We met in a, a circle of women. I know, I know. <laughs> From it's, The Bachelor. It's so and uh, it could come like full circle somehow down the line. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, we'll do it. Yeah. Maybe like I'm thinking like summer 2025. Yeah. Hey, that's fine <laughs> with me. Yeah, we got put we, it yeah, out there. We got a yeah. lot a lot of things to do before then. Yeah. Um, but thanks for coming on. If I, I know so many people know you, but if you don't, go yeah. follow Sarah at, at Sarah Heron. Sarah with an H. Yes. Heron with two R's. Yes. O N. And yeah. Thank you. Follow her journey. Yeah. You'll learn a lot. Yeah. (laughs) Thank you, Leslie.